thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm really thrilled to get the chance to talk to you today. This was a, a great opportunity for, uh, for me and my wife to come see Puerto Rico. Um, but I was really excited about the possibility of having students from here, whether they be graduate or undergraduate students, getting some training in, in what mass spectrometry looks like at a major research institution like Vanderbilt. I, I really don't know of other schools that have invested as, as strongly in mass spectrometry as has Vanderbilt. So I really hope that we can find opportunities for students here to come up for the summer and, and, and get some exposure to that. So I'm uh, part of the Department of Biomedical Informatics. That might sound like we have a huge number of people working in bioinformatics, but they're really very different things. Most of my department is actually people invested in clinical informatics, not bioinformatics. So we have the researchers who are supporting the, the uh, medical research foundation of, of Vanderbilt, and we have other people who are busily working on electronic patient healthcare records, which is actually most of what the people in biomedical informatics are doing at Vanderbilt. Uh, I'm also part of the Department of Biochemistry. That's a secondary appointment. But it, it reflects the kind of dual role that I've, I've played throughout my career, being the computer scientist that the bio, biochemists could talk to, and also being the, the biochemist that the, uh, that the computer scientists could talk to to figure out what each, each of these other groups mean to each other. There's very frequently a communication impasse between the two. And in part, that's what I'm hoping to address through this talk today, to help introduce <laughs> what's going on in that black box when you pass your mass spectrometry data to it, how are you getting information back? What is the, what's the manipulation of those data that provides information from the data? So I'll start with a, a brief overview of bottom-up proteomics, uh, looking at both discovery and targeted or verification uh, pathways that we use our mass spectrometry for. And from there, I'll start talking about the major algorithms that we use to identify proteins and, and post-translational modifications, et cetera, from tandem mass spectrometry data sets. Uh, so those will include three major stages. How do we match peptides to tandem mass spectra? Kind of the standard database search approach on that. Secondly, how do we evaluate the error rates among the identifications that we produce from tandem mass spectral matching? And thirdly, how do we assemble proteins or infer proteins from these data sets? So I'm going to start with a, a, a brief look at the, the, the ways in which we disrupt proteins and peptides as, as part of tandem mass spectrometry. I find that people, in my, in my classes at least, frequently get lost in all the different stages at which we cut these things up. And I figure if we, if we take it sort of one step at a time, uh, we'll get a little clearer on that. So we start with the process of denaturing and re reducing proteins. Now, you as biochemists uh, will probably have a little better background on this, but of course, we, we talk a lot about peptides in proteomics, and I think this is sort of jarring for people who are very new to the field. If, uh, if we're so interested in proteins, why do we start by disrupting the structures of these proteins? And the answer is, of course, that the, the structures that proteins take on can be very complex and, and in fact, uh, a great hindrance to our ability to learn about them. So by being able to denature the proteins, by, by being able to unfold them by you know, slapping them in urea or whatever, uh, we, we actually get them to behave a whole lot more uniformly. Next, they've got all these nice disulfides. Now, I, I think of these as sort of safety pins holding these structures in place. So if we can break the disulfide bonds, if we can reduce them and, and alkylate them to prevent them from reforming, then that's going to be very helpful to us. So this takes the, the three-dimensional structure of the protein and reduces it to something more like a, a long line of amino acids in, in solution. That's a whole lot more tractable for analysis. The next stage, though, is, is kind of the, the counterintuitive step. Imagine that you have a thousand different proteins in a mixture. The first step then, uh, the, that, we, that we take towards uh, the proteome is to digest them up. Well, that seems sort of counterintuitive because we've taken a mixture of a thousand proteins and turned it into 10,000 peptides. So by making the mixture even more complex as a first step, you, you might think you've taken a big step backward in understanding it. But in fact, peptides are a whole lot easier to deal with. They're a whole lot easier to separate and to get back from your column after the fact. They're a whole lot easier to do tandem mass spectrometry on and, and get uh, structurally informative tandem mass spectra back. So we're going to turn them into peptides at this stage. And then finally, once, the, uh, once we've got a bunch of ions of this particular peptide to deal with, we're going to undergo CID. This is the process where we're breaking apart ions of a particular peptide to get structural information. And we'll talk about those steps a little more as we move ahead. So here you see we have started with a mixture of peptides at the upper left. Uh, we are, uh, we're, we're starting with these peptides, and we're going to use some sort of separation on them. <coughs> Excuse me. 
now, I'm not showing what we would do in a very complex experiment where we might use a prefractionation. Maybe we would use isoelectric focusing of peptides. Perhaps we would use strong cation exchange in a mud pit experiment. Uh, maybe we would use a high pH LC separation to create aliquots first. But this is uh, really just a diagram of about the simplest possible experiment where we're going to use LC and SMS. So we're just using reverse phase liquid chromatography. These beads are covered with carbon 18 chains. The peptides stick to those nicely, but not so strongly that we can't get those peptides back. Now the, the gradient I've shown here in red is, is just showing the increasing amount of acetonitrile or whatever hydrophobic solvent we're using to beat the peptide, to compete the peptides off of the beads that they're stuck to. Uh, and as they, uh, as, uh, at a particular t moment in time over say an hour long gradient, those peptides are going to be competed off of the beads and flow into the mass spec. Now each of these peptides gets measured in two different ways. Uh, well first off, if it's not an ion, we don't measure it in the mass spec. So we have to be able to ionize it, and typically we're using electrospray for that. Um, now, uh, that can be nanoelectrospray, where you have very low flow rates, or microspray, where you have a higher flow rate, as you've got with the existing pump uh, here at the, the proteomic center. Uh, but the, that charge is what enables us to create ions of these peptides, and because they're ions, we can measure them. The, the, the ions then get measured two different ways. The first is a simple mass spectrum. The instrument scans through a range of M over Z values, ejecting ions of that mass to charge from the, from the trap. They hit a, uh, an electron multiplier. This creates a signal that we can measure. And uh, when we have a large number of ions at a particular mass to charge value, we're going to get a large peak. When we get a relatively small number of ions or a set of ions that don't ionize as well, we're going to get a smaller peak. But these, th this represents sort of an inventory of what ions are currently available to the mass spectrometer to interrogate. From that, from that mass spectrum, these mass to charge values and intensities, it's going to prioritize a list of, say, eight different ions that we're going to target for tandem mass spectrometry. That's typical for an LTQ experiment. So the instrument uh, records the eight most intense ions that it sees in this particular mass spectrum and, pr and targets those for isolation and fragmentation. So as it processes each ion, it's doing it this complex series of steps that I'm showing in the middle row. The first is that it's opening the, tra opening the trap and allowing only the ions of a particular mass to charge value to flow into the trap. Uh, and so maybe you have 10,000 copies of a particular peptide floating around in the trap. At this stage, we're going to undergo CID, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. But collision-induced dissociation is the process of, of beating, these gas uh, beating gas molecules against these peptide ions that causes them to gain energy until they break. So the, that breakage is, is starting with a uniform collection of, uh, of homogeneous ions, basically. They're all ions of the same mass to charge. They're ostensibly the same peptide. By, uh, by undergoing CID, we're producing fragments from those. And some of them are going to break in different places, so we're going to have a, a heterogeneous collection of fragments in the trap. But they all reflect one type of peptide, generally. So by scanning those out to a tandem mass spectrum, we produce the, the the fingerprint, basically, for this particular peptide in a single tandem mass spectrum. And the mass specs can do that very fast. Even an instrument uh, at the age of the LTQ, uh, which is, I think, something like five years old now, maybe uh, six or seven, actually, you can produce 10,000 of these tandem mass spectra in the space of about 90 minutes. So ostensibly, you could identify 10,000 tandem mass spectra uh, and identify 10,000 different peptides in a single experiment. In practice, that's not so feasible. In general, we're identifying something like 10 to 20 percent of the spectra we collect. So this is a, uh, if you identify, say, 2,000 tandem mass spectra in the space of an hour, generally people feel reasonably good about that. You'd like to go a little higher, of course. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the way that the, the world works. So the informatics I've represented here on the bottom row of this, this chart, this reflects the fact that we start with a pile of tandem mass spectra. And the mass spectra don't come with handy labels. They have mass to charge values. They have intensities. But they don't say, I'm from this peptide. Instead, we have to be able to match these peptides to pept uh, these, these tandem mass spectra to peptide sequences. And that's the process carried out by the database search algorithm. That'll be the first that we talk about. Uh, and from that, we can then discern which peptide, uh, which, which spectra we feel are confidently identified. That's the, the next uh, type of algorithm we're going to talk about. And finally, what proteins do we invoke to represent the peptides we've identified? That's the final step. So that's kind of a chart of the talk. Let's go ahead and move forward. <coughs> Now, I've, I've learned uh, recently that you've just picked up a second kind of mass spectrometer here, the, the water Zevo. Oh, thank you. That's very helpful. 
the, the Zevo is not like the Ion Trap. It's a triple quadrupole instrument, and it lets you take on different kinds of uh, different kinds of experiments. It's actually really fantastic for quantitative proteomics. So in the shotgun experiment, we start out with something where we don't know the content of the sample and we want to find out. In the Zevo, the, in an SRM or selected reaction monitoring experiment, you're carrying out a very different kind of experiment. In this experiment, you've set out your list of what proteins you're interested in measuring, and then the instrument gives you quantities back uh, on what, what the, the peptides and, and uh, fragment ions from those peptides uh, look like in a chromatographic process. Just a moment. Hmm. I feel much better than last week, I gotta say that. So, this process has some similarities. We still start with peptides at the upper left. We're still undergoing liquid chromatography in the next stage. We're still using electrospray to produce ions from them. But in this case, we're going to be measuring a particular set of fragment ions from a particular set of peptides. Maybe you've set aside 50 proteins you want to measure. And so you have a set of peptides associated with those proteins, maybe two or three apiece. And for each of those peptides, you're gonna measure two or three fragment ions. So these, uh, this combination of peptide precursor and fragment from that peptide is called a transition. And you can measure some number of those for each experiment. I'm not sure what, actually what the Zevo is capable of, but something on the order of 50 or 100 transitions in an experiment. That's probably a very reasonable estimate. So the instrument is going to cycle through each of these transitions, conducting the experiment shown on the middle row for each. So in the, 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 there are three quadrupoles, that's why we call it a triple quadrupole instrument. The first quadrupole is going to pass only the ions of a particular peptide through the quadrupole. The second quadrupole is going to beat them against gas molecules until they break. And the third quadrupole is going to pass only a particular fragment ion in response to that peptide. So maybe you told it, I have an ion, uh, a peptide that's got a mass of, uh, of uh, 784, and it produces a fragment at 267. And so quad one is set to pass the first, quad three is set to pass the third, the second is blowing up the peptides as they pass through. Then the instrument measures how much intensity ap appears at this particular moment of time. And it goes on cycling through the rest of the list of targets, and then produces a chromatogram for each of these fragments for each of these peptide ions. This allows you to quantify very accurately how much of a particular set of peptides you've got. And as if you've spiked in labeled versions of those peptides, you can compare the quantity you spiked in with the quantity you saw and use this to get to measure probably within 10% uh, CV what the, what the quantity of that peptide is in this mixture. Okay, on we go. I'll try that. Okay. There we go. So collision-induced association is key to both of these processes because it's the, the, the means by which we produce fragment ions from a particular peptide. Now I want you to think of this as kind of a heating process. We've got a bunch of these ions all sitting in the trap at the same time, and there's always gas in the trap, so this is not a surprise to the ions. But because, they're, because of what we're calling a tickle voltage, something that sort of causes them to move more uh, rapidly through this, massive, uh, through this gas uh, collection, we start accumulating collisions between gas molecules and the peptide ions at a higher rate than normal. And maybe after about 10 of these collisions, the peptide is heated up so much that it starts doing two things. One, it starts contorting itself in a lot of ways that it wouldn't normally. It's not just in its lowest energy state, it's actually getting uh, more excited. Um, but those, pepti those uh, peptides are bouncing off of gas molecules, the, and the protons that we deposited on them to start making them ions start moving around in ways that they wouldn't. And eventually, a, a proton sits down on a peptide bond of that peptide, and it breaks, creating what's called an oxazolone ion on the N-terminal side, and a small peptide on the, on the C-terminal side. So this creates a pair of fragments at a particular peptide bond for some peptide that we started with. And the result is that we get tandem mass spectra that represent the information about what breakages occurred in that peptide. Now in this case, I'm showing a 10 mer, so we've got a 10, 10 amino acids strung together here, and I'm showing a, an association between the last six amino acids, starting at the G, uh, well the first G, uh, so the, the last six amino acids break off to form what's called a Y6 ion. A Y ion is the C terminus, of, uh, a, a small peptide formed from a big peptide. So here we've got the Y6 ion showing up at 572. That's the, that, that 572 represents the sum of the last six amino acid masses plus water, because that's, that's really the difference between the two of them, and uh, one ionizing proton in this case. 
Then we have another break that happens at the isoleucine just to the N-terminal side of that Y6 ion. And this one, predictably, is called the Y7 ion because it contains the last seven amino acids. Now that Y7 ion appears at 685. So 685 differs from 572 by how much? 572 and 685? You didn't realize this was interactive. <laughs> 113, I hear it down front, excellent. So 113. Now I would point out that isoleucine is the amino acid that differentiates the Y7 ion from the Y6 ion. And isoleucine has a mass of? 113, excellent. So we have a correspondence between the masses of the amino acids and the, delt the deltas between the fragment ions that are produced from them. This is, so you could think that I could simply look at this tandem mass spectrum and just read the sequence right off of it. This is in practice quite a lot harder than it looks. So we have developed algorithms. This thing is a little quirky about jumping to the next slide, isn't it? There we go. So we have developed a standard set of algorithms. Uh, this is the uh, diagram of a database search algorithm that have become very, very standard in the field for matching peptide sequences to tandem mass spectra. So I want to make very, very clear, this is something I always ping grad students on in, in exams. We do not read sequence from tandem mass spectra in database search. Instead, we are starting from a source of sequences, a set of known sequences for this organism, and from that set of known protein sequences, we're going to figure out what matches. So let's walk through this piece by piece. We start up at the top with fa a FASTA sequence database. This is a, a database that represents all of the proteins known to exist in this organism. So the human proteome is something like 20,000 genes, but those 20,000 genes correspond to something like 35,000 isoforms, something on that order. The numbers vacillate around, and if you were to use the human subset from SwissProt versus RefSeq versus Ensemble, you'd e each of them has a different number of proteins that appear at least they all point to roughly the same set of genes, so this is good. Some of them include every possible isoform and some include just a minimal set. So you're going to find a, a, quite a, a variation there. Okay, so we start with our FASTA database as the source of proteins. We now must emulate in software what you have already done on the bench. You treated your sample with trypsin. The software is going to emulate what trypsin would do if it were to cut all of these proteins. And so we can figure out what are the possible peptides that correspond to all the possible proteins for the species. The, we then have what's called a PTM expander that allows the software to emulate what, uh, how that set of peptides would grow if we were to allow possible uh, post-translational modifications on top of that set of peptides. Now we have to figure out which peptide sequences get compared to each spectrum. And this is really where the genius of the Sequest algorithm was so clever back in 1994. Because Jimmy Yang and, and John Yates realized you don't have to compare every sequence to every tandem mass spectrum. You only have to compare those sequences to a tandem mass spectrum that match its mass accurately. Now in an LTQ, we know a precursor mass to charge value, a peptide mass to charge value, within say 1.5 m over z. If you have an orbitrap, you know it within 10 ppm, and I tell you, that's a lot smaller. That's like two orders of magnitude down in terms of the number of peptides you have to compare to it. But with an LTQ, you're probably going to have to compare in a, in a semi-triptic search, we'll talk about what that means, about 50,000 different peptide sequences to every tandem mass spectrum in a human search. So it's still a lot of sequences. So uh, those peptides that we're going to compare to this particular spectrum we call candidate peptides. And for each of those candidate peptides, we need to have two steps. One is to predict what the tandem mass spectrum should look like if it were this peptide sequence. And the other is that we have to compare that prediction of what the spectrum should look like to what it really looks like. Now, people think that, that these, uh, these algorithms like Sequest and Mascot, that they're all about the scoring. But that's really only the very, very final stage. In Sequest, we produce scores like the X-core score that tells you uh, the cross-correlation score that relates what the prediction of the spectrum uh, looks like in comparison to the observed spectrum. But really, all of the algorithms share uh, more or less the same approach to these first elements. It's only the last one that, that differs uh, between things like mascot and sequest and X-tandem. They differ to some small extent in how they do the prediction of fragment ions as well. Um, but really, there's not much difference in, in the other steps of this, pipeway, uh, of this pathway. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why trypsin prediction, uh, ha predicting trypsin's actions can be a little tricky. Now, uh, it is possible to search only for those peptides that would be produced by trypsin if every arginine and every lysine were cut. 
But in practice, nobody does that because tryp trypsin is not perfectly, uh, is not uh, completely penetrant in, in cutting every lysine and every trips and, and every arginine that uh, that appears in a, in a protein sequence. There are lots of circumstances under which it won't cut. For example, when you have two basics right next door to each other, if you've got lysine lysine, you're not going to cut both of them generally. So uh, I thought it would be useful to talk through some examples of that. At the start, we've got this big blue bar and we've got some breaks in it. Uh, that represents all the different places where this protein sequence can be chopped by a trypsin. Now, uh, we can imagine the fully triptych case, that's the first one shown beneath it, that corresponds to a perfect uh, trypsin site cutting site on one end and a perfect trypsin cutting site on the other end, and those are great. Those are the fully triptychs and they have no missed cleavages in that case. We may also imagine peptides that match to a trypsin cut site on one end but not the other. And those are semi-triptych peptides. If you've got a sample that's got fewer than 100 proteins in it, you probably want to invest time in doing a semi-triptych search. Because those semi-triptych peptides, even though they're lower in probability than the fully triptych peptides, still occur at some lower probability. And if you've got less than 100 proteins in your sample, odds are you're going to see some of those semi-triptychs in addition. Um, we always do searches with semi-triptych specificity because it's also very useful in, in figuring out which peptides or which spectra were identified successfully at the end of the day. But it does take about 10 times more time to, to conduct the search to do a semi-triptych. Um, and then of course you may have missed cleavages, cases where a peptide conforms to trypsin cleavages on both end, on both ends but also uh, contains within it another possible uh, trypsin cut site that didn't cut. And of course, there's always those regions of proteins that don't have a lot of arginines and lysines in them. You don't find a lot of arginines and lysines in the middle of a transmembrane domain. So uh, things like that will uh, be sites that wouldn't be digested by trypsin, but might be by some of the other proteases that uh, Dr. Crisea mentioned just a moment ago. Okay, so that's, those are all the reasons why a, uh, a trip, uh, uh, modif modeling trypsin behavior is not as straightforward as it might seem. Next, I want to talk about the effect of post-translational modifications in your search. This is a really important piece that a lot of people miss, so I want to make sure we talk about that. Every time you allow for a post-translational modification on an amino acid residue, the software is in effect forking the peptide into two possibilities, one where it did get modified and one where it didn't get modified. And when we do that with common amino acids, we get exponential effects by this splitting. In this case, I'm showing a short peptide from uh, alpha casein in, in cows. So this is just a milk protein. Um, in this case, we're doing a phosphopeptide search. Now, we, are, we would uh, allow for the possibility that uh, serine might or might not contain a phosphorylation. Threonine might or might not contain a, three, uh, a phosphorylation. And if we're being completists, then tyrosine may, might or might not contain a phosphorylation. Now the cost for doing a, a phosphotyrosine search is not great, simply because tyrosine is not that common an amino acid. But serine and threonine are very frequent amino, amino acids. And as a result, when we look at this peptide that contains only one, two, three, four, the nine different amino acid residues, we see that there are, that instead of considering this peptide just once, we have to consider it eight times because each of the three uh, serines and, and, and threonines found in this amino acid have to be considered in the yes or no consider, uh, possibility. So that gives us eight different combinations of modified and unmodified. This is why doing a phosphorylation search takes a very long time in comparison to doing a, a search without phosphorylations. The next is how this peptide mass filter plays into the consideration. If you have a very wide tolerance uh, allowable for the, uh, the accuracy with which you know each peptide or with the, uh, the, the intact masses of these of the, uh, associated with these tandem mass spectra, you're going to compare far more sequences to this tandem mass spectrum than if you know it very accurately. Uh, so what we see in this case is that we have a particular peptide uh, that has a mass somewhere in the middle of this range. Well, okay, well I'm just not going to, I'm just... Well, uh, okay, I can, I can point with the correct direction, yeah. So, so here we have our observation and it falls somewhere in this space. We have this width associated with it and uh, this reflects the accuracy with which we think we know the precursor. And so any peptide that falls outside that range never gets compared to this, to this spectrum at all. So if you set this precursor range down too tightly, it's possible that your correct sequence will not be matched to, the, to this tandem mass spectrum at all, not even considered as a, as a match because of this, uh, this window. All right. 
Now, any sequence within that window does have to be compared. So for every, every sequence that falls within that window, we're going to predict what the spectrum should look like and make a comparison. And that invokes a cost. It, there's a cost in modeling what the spectrum should look like, and there's a cost in doing the matching to this tandem mass spectrum, and they're not trivial. So setting that window too wide costs you time. Setting that window too narrow means that you've lost uh, the chance to compare the correct sequence in some case to the tandem mass spectrum. Now I'm showing just one scorer, uh, one scorer that ever gets used for matching tandem mass spectra to peptide sequences. And that's, uh, that's not really a mistake, I think, because there are lots and lots of different scoring systems that have been put out there. The one used by uh, Phoenix from GeneBio is completely different than the one that we see for Mascot, which is completely different than the one from Sequest. And instead, I'm choosing one that I think is intuitively um, kind of a sensible one to think about. It's just kind of a good starting place to think about. Instead of thinking about matching a predicted spectrum against an observed spectrum, I want you to think about a jar of marbles. Now this jar has a thousand marbles in it, of which 900 are white and 100 are black. And in this case, I'm using the black marbles to indicate places in the spectrum that are occupied by a peak. So maybe this black marble represents the peak at 584 where we observed a fragment ion. Or they might be white, which suggests that there was either just kind of a very small noise nubbin that we knocked out, or simply no peak at all uh, that was centroided in this particular region over here at say 362. All right, so now I have my jar of marbles, and I have some list of locations that I have associated with this particular peptide sequence. In this case, I have said that 20 locations within the spectrum should be occupied by peaks if it does really represent this peptide sequence. So I can simply pluck from this, from this marble jar 20, 20 different marbles reflecting those locations in the spectrum that I thought should be occupied. Now I can simply ask how many marbles in my hand are black and how many are white? So what's a, what's a good scenario here? All black. All black, absolutely, sure. If my hand is full of black marbles, there are no white marbles, it means that every location where I predicted a peak, I found one. Now that doesn't happen, not in practice. Uh, maybe for a very, very simple toy spectrum or something. But in reality, we generally predict a much larger number of fragment ions than we can possibly match in the tandem mass spectrum. Frankly, a lot of the software uses such a bad model of how peptides break that it predicts really unrealistic locations like B1 that A doesn't, doesn't form under CID conditions and B would fall outside the scan range anyway. So let's just say that our predictions are, are uh, hyper-aggressive and we only expect some number of these ions to match anyway. Okay, but how good is it if I match 10 of 20 ions or 8 of 20 ions or 15 of 20 ions? The hypergeometric hyper -geometric model gives us a way to put a, an actual p-value on this. And in this case, it's not a, a cited p-value, one saying what's the probability of this or better. It's just a probability that reflects what's, the, what's the, the probability that this particular number of hits would occur by random chance alone. Now I want to note that these probabilities are not uh, one minus the probability that this is the correct match. A lot of people deeply misinterpret the numbers that way. This is just the probability saying what is the likelihood that this happens by random chance alone. That's a very different question. So uh, in this case, we see our little equation down here at the bottom. Now uh, I know it's just before lunch and this is not the time to break out the equations, but this one's not that painful. We have 100 black marbles in the jar. These reflect 100 peaks that were present in the spectrum. We have 900 white marbles in the jar. Those reflect the 900 locations in the spectrum that could have contained a peak but didn't. And we had 1,000 total marbles in the jar. In my hand, I had 15 black marbles reflecting the 15 peaks that we looked for and found. And we had five, uh, five white marbles in my hand. These reflect the five locations we looked for a peak but didn't find one. And a total of 20 marbles that we looked for uh, that, were, that we held in our hands. So we can work the combinations on this and out pops the other side a, a probability of this particular occurrence happening. Now is that score good? That's kind of a harder question to address and frankly a lot of people have foundered on that question so we move on to a, an empirical way to evaluate what scores are meaningful reflecting a good match and what scores are bad.
Now when I was a grad student, I wrote some software called DTA Select that would let people go through a whole pile of Sequest IDs and figure out which ones were good and which ones were bad. But we struggled mightily with this question of how we decided which ones were good and which ones were bad. In the end, I went around asking the postdocs in the lab, what do you consider a good score for a plus one? What do you consider a good score for a plus two? We encoded that in the software and it applied those static thresholds to every search we did and we got it published and people thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. The answer, however, is that that's a lousy way to do it. Asking the postdocs what they consider a good match or a bad one is going to give you really unreliable information. If you ask the author of the software, you're likely to get a, a very low score. In any, uh, any score above one is good. <laughs> you know, if you ask the, uh, the credulous uh, graduate student, you're going to get a, a, a really high score, uh, you know, maybe a medium score. And if you ask a postdoc who's hard bitten and doesn't want to work here anymore, you're going to get a really high number saying, I don't believe anything I see anymore. <laughs> All right, so that's bad. Instead, we need empirical ways to evaluate the quality of the identifications we've produced. All right, I swear I'm going to finish th this up in less than 13 minutes. So we have, <coughs> we create a whole new set. What's that? What's the probability? What is the probability that the p-value on, okay, let me just say this, tabs believe in lunch. <laughs> we believe in lunch. So we are going to wrap this up in 13 minutes. So we create, as part of our sequence database, not just all the known proteins of humans, but also fake proteins based on those. So maybe we had the sequence for albumin and we flip that, N-terminus for C-terminus, and add this fake protein to our database. Now we have a way to estimate what bogus hits score because we, we, are, we know some subpopulation of the, of the hits that are truly bogus. So we, uh, what we expect here is that when a spectrum is falsely identified, it has just as good a chance of matching to a bogus sequence as it does to one that is at least potentially real. Everyone get that? So when we see a, when we see a hit to a false protein, we know it is false. But we also expect that there is, that there is another false hit in our, in our database search of the same score buried in there somewhere as well. But it's matching to a true protein, so it could be mistaken for a true ID. All right, so when we apply, uh, let us, let's sort all of our hits now, all of our spectra from best score to worst score. And now we're going to say, I'm going to throw a line right here and say anything above that is great, anything below that is trash. This is a, a, what we would call a dichotomy that we're throwing across this. So we're going to say that we have some number of bogus hits above that, and we, the, what, which is to say hits to these decoy proteins in the database. And we're going to assume that for every one of those hits to a, false, a known false protein, we have another hit to a, a true protein that's also erroneous. So here we can, we, can double, we can double the number of hits above our threshold to say, what's the true number of bogus hits above this threshold? And divide that by the total number of hits over the threshold in order to estimate our false discovery rate for peptide spectrum matches. So this is an empirical way to figure out what score, whether it's computed in terms of a, a point probability or an X score or a mascot ion score. Whatever the score type, we can use all of them to sort our hits, apply a threshold, and figure out what false discovery rate we can obtain from it. So this has been the great leveler of, uh, of score evaluation and uh, really, I think, has been uh, one of the most important effects on proteo the proteomics field in the last five years, that people... Uh, People are no longer able to publish identifications that are completely erroneous uh, without having to pass some sort of uh, publishing guideline that says you have to, you have to evaluate the, the error in your IDs. This is not, however, the only way to do it. Now, I'm going to give you a quick graphical look at what this looks like. Here, uh, we've separated all the IDs from a particular raw file into two populations, those that hit to potentially real sequences and those that hit to known false sequences. You can see in purple that we have this really high peak that represents these decoy hits. Uh, and the highest score we achieve is right here about 35. So a score of 35 was the highest score we saw in something that we know to be a bogus hit. So some people have said that that means you should only accept things that fall higher than 35 in score. But see, that throws out an awful lot of sensitivity. You don't want to throw out every low-scoring peptide just because there happens to be one spectrum that randomly got a really high score.
So instead, what people have looked for is a way to apply some threshold that gives us an acceptable mix of, of false and true identifications. And typically, that's something like 5% uh, FDR or 2% FDR or even 1% FDR for people who are very cautious. Now, peptide profit is a very different approach. I've been talking about target decoy as a way to compute aggregate error, not to say what is the false, uh, the false positive chance for this particular tandem mass spectrum, but rather what's the error rate in a whole collection of spectra. Peptide profit comes at it from a very different pro point of view, and it's, its intent, uh, this is software that's uh, part of the transproteomic pipeline, it's part of scaffold, um, it's been coded up in a, in a wide variety of ways. So I think you, you probably have a lot of experience looking at peptide profit uh, probabilities. But instead of looking at aggregate error, peptide profit is focused on saying, what's the probability of correctness for this particular peptide? Now, that might seem a little pedantic. You might think, why do I need to evaluate the probability of correctness for every single peptide? And the answer is that peptide profit is connected to protein profit. And protein profit uses these peptide probabilities in assessing the probabilities of proteins that get assembled from them. So this, these represent rather different ways of thinking, but in fact, some, very diff uh, some relatively new versions of peptide profit uh, back up their assessments of uh, peptide error rates by using uh, what, what, they, what you might think of as, a, as sort of a, a semi-supervised training. It, it uses the, the, the scores of, of known false matches as a way to tune up its, its estimate of, of these peptide probabilities. So it's pretty, uh, pretty smart software when you get down to it. Okay, on we go. So let's talk about building proteins from these. I mentioned that we were going to have to circle back around to this in a while. Um, we had started by chopping all of our proteins up into peptides, which of course threw away information about which peptides were linked to which. And that's a big problem if you're trying to do uh, uh, some very insightful isoform studies or um, look at long stretches of proteins. So. Um, of course, evolution leads to an awful lot of proteins sharing sequence. If I start with a human sample and run a search with a, a yeast database, I will still get some hits, and some of them will be real. And that's because humans and yeast share sequences through the process of evolution. That may be through a process, in, in that case, it's a process of orthology, where sequences are conserved across species boundaries. But there's also the process of paralogy. Lots of species have gone through genome du duplications over time that have led to multiple variants of a particular gene being found throughout the genome. So both of these causes may lead to this. If you're using a multi-species database like all of SwissProt to do your searching, um, you will assuredly hit proteins outside your species of interest just through the, the orthology problem. But even if you search within humans, you're still going to find multiple copies of, of genes in some cases. Likewise, because we don't have one gene, one protein, we have multiple isoforms to, to consider for each gene. And when we run into a lot of cases, we're, we're going to see cases where the exons of a particular gene get spliced together in different ways um, in response to disease or just part of uh, the normal differentiation of, of, uh, of how development goes. So uh, in this case, we might have exons 1 through 5 followed by 8. We might have exons 1 through 6 followed by 8, 1 through 5 followed by 7 and 8. There are lots of possibilities. And, and this type of exon shuffling is, is commonplace. So that makes it rather difficult when we've identified a whole bunch of peptides to figure out what proteins come from them. This is an ugly example. This is a case of a xenograft. So we have a, a human tumor grown in a mouse, uh, and now we've excised it. So our sample contains human proteins, and hu the human proteome is already quite a mess. And it also contains mouse proteins, and the mouse proteome is not particularly simpler. So now, whenever we identify peptides, we have to figure out proteins. So I'm showing what's called a bipartite graph representation of these data. At the left, we have protein groups that could explain those. Uh, those uh, th these are proteins that could be inferred from these sets of peptides. At the right, we have blocks of peptides that could correspond to these as well. So our approach has been to use what's called a greedy algorithm. We ask what protein group accounts for the most peptides that haven't already been accounted for. And in this case, the software recognizes this human protein as explaining all of these green peptides. So this peptide, this peptide, this, this peptide, this peptide, these 10, these two, and these two. Now that doesn't explain all the peptides here. So we still need to invoke other proteins to explain these three peptides. Uh, and in this case, the software recognizes this other human protein that explains all of the remaining evidence for peptides. 
So here we could have invoked all of these proteins in the, maybe in the 1990s, but today we are, we've moved into the 2000s. Okay, it's actually the, the 2010s, but uh, we, we are going to invoke just as many proteins as we must, but not one more. And this is really where con the concept of parsimony comes into play. Don't step beyond your evidence. You, uh, you should really work hard to make the simplest possible protein explanation to explain all the peptides you've got. And this is, uh, this is where parsimony uh, stands highest. You can dramatically overstate your protein content if you start invoking any protein that has any connection to an identified peptide. Um, in this case, I want to note that the software claims that table 1x isoform B for human and table 1x isoform A for human is all we need to explain all of these peptides. Does that mean that none of the mouse proteins are present? I see the big head shake. That's right. It, it does not say that, that the, protein from, the proteins from mouse are not present. However, we're making a parsimonious claim here, and that means we're being really harsh on ourselves. So it is possible that the mouse proteins are there, but it's most parsimonious to eliminate them from our, our explanation. Protein doesn't, uh, proteomics does not generally prove negatives. It doesn't prove that things are not present, because our sensitivity is not comprehensive. So scoring differs quite a lot from algorithm to algorithm in the way that we match the uh, predicted tandem mass spectrum to observed tandem mass spectra. But uh, this is not to say that the way that mascot and X-tandem and so on work is completely different. In fact, they have great commonality. And this, this scoring piece is a relatively minor piece of the equation, frankly. Um, likewise, there are, there are these two different techniques for measuring peptide error. Group-wise error rate, uh, a false discovery rate for aggregate collections of peptide IDs, and also a, the, the peptide profit approach, the, the one to assess what is the probability of correctness for each peptide identification separately. They really solve very different problems, and uh, they have different adherence, different pluses and minuses. If you are interested in knowing uh, probability of correctness for a particular protein, or you care very much about whether a particular exon is, uh, is being expressed in, in protein form, then using something like peptide profit makes a lot more sense. If you're just trying to assess group-wide, uh, uh, list-wide error rates, then sticking with target decoy is completely defensible. Um, and the other thing to really keep in mind is that proteins are inferential. Because we're digesting our samples at the very start, the protein list is inferred from peptide evidence. So in that way, the if you want to know much more directly what's going on in your sample, looking at the peptides you see is actually um, much closer to the data that we're actually collecting. It's worth keeping that in mind whenever you're looking at a protein list that comes from these. And with that, I'm happy to take a question. We have three minutes before I said.